Well, I want to make, thank uh, everyone who made it possible for this dinosaur to return to Portugal. I was last here 36 years ago. Um, it has changed just a little bit uh, since that time. Uh, when I was in Porto 36 years ago, I think there was one other tourist, an Australian chap, and uh, now I understand they get a million per year, and I think they were all there earlier in the week. Um, it's perhaps appropriate that I'm here. My first career uh, was actually as an electrical engineer, and I was involved, uh, first of all, in the uh, transition period from vacuum tubes, or valves as the British would style them, to transistors, and also the transition from high fidelity to stereophonic high fidelity sound. Um, that was a failed career. I was a little ahead of my time. I came up and invented an instrument to replace a very large mechanical thing, took it very proudly to my boss, who promptly fired me for wasting the company's time. He said there was no future in that, and that was an integrated circuit. So I became a historian. Now that is a selfie. Uh, one of my first research interests, really the way that I entered into everything many years back at Texas was through Sir John Herschel. And Herschel introduced me to a lot of people. And one of the most interesting to me was Charles Piazzi Smith, uh, named after a, a Sicilian astronomer. And this is his own self-portrait. This is his own image of himself in 1848. Uh, Piazzi uh, went to the Cape of Good Hope uh, shortly before that time. He went in the late 1830s. And when photography was announced to the public in 1839, his old friend Herschel started sending him uh, instructions on how to do photographs. And he's a really interesting case study because he's working in isolation, almost like a laboratory isolation. He's not seen things from Europe. He's not able to talk to other people, but he started producing calotypes uh, at the Cape of Good Hope, a few of which survive. Uh, Talbot uh, also wrote to him at Herschel's insistence, so he began to meet Talbot through that. He then went on to Edinburgh to become the Astronomer Royal of Scotland, a very grand appointment for a young man. Uh, arrived there in the 1840s, and the observatory at that time was on Calton Hill in Edinburgh. How many of you have been to Edinburgh? A fair number of you. You know that Calton Hill, of course, dominates the city. That's where the old observatory was. And more critically, that's where the studio of Robert Adamson was. And I always say Adamson and Hill. Um, but that's, of course, where the marvelous early calotype portraits were taken. So Piazzi lived and worked within a few feet of where all this photographic activity was going on. But he got caught up in astronomy. He was also a professor at the university at that point. Uh, as far as I know, he didn't really do any photography uh, in the 1840s once he arrived in Edinburgh. But he also had a problem. Uh, those of you who've been to Edinburgh possibly know that its nickname was Old Reeky. Uh, it had tremendous air pollution, tremendous smoke uh, in the valley there. And so this is one of Piazzi's watercolors uh, taken from his observatory, and you can see all of the smoke in that in the atmosphere. Now, if you're an astronomer, that's a big problem because you basically can't see anything. And if you're familiar with Scottish weather in general, that's also a big problem. So in 1856, he invented the Hubble telescope. He had read Sir Isaac Newton's uh, theory that eventually the quality of optics would come to the point where the atmosphere itself would be the limiting factor. And as soon as hostilities had died down a bit, he applied for permission to go to Tenerife, which was the highest mountain he could get to, literally to take a telescope above the clouds. Exactly the same concept as the Hubble Space Telescope and embarked in 1856 to do that. He got funding from the Royal Society and then suddenly had a problem. He had been good friends with Herschel, another one of his paintings here. Um, Piazzi's on the right. Uh, Sir John Herschel lived at Slough, he's in the middle. The gentleman on the left is Dr. John Lee, which I wish we had a couple days to go into. 
Egyptologist, an absolutely fascinating person. Um, but this is the circle that he worked in. And Herschel uh, said to the Royal Society that since Mr. Smith is an expert photographer, he should be equipped with photographic apparatus uh, to take to Tenerife. The problem was the last time that uh, Piazzi had done any photography was at the Cape of Good Hope in the Calatite period. Now we're well into wet collodion, and he can't very well tell Herschel that I don't know anything about photography. So on his way down, he stopped in Porto and met the Baron de Forrester, Joseph James Forrester, who I suspect he already knew uh, through connections in Edinburgh, certainly. Uh, Forrester was uh, a very interesting photographer. I don't know if many of you know his work. Uh, some of it is, is uh, studies of people along the River Duro. Uh, but I had the great privilege uh, earlier this week of seeing this at the new Portuguese Museum of Photography. And this sort of landscape of Duro is where Forrester was used to working in wet collodion, and he quickly taught Piazzi how to do this. As a sidebar, I'm very impressed with the security of Portuguese photographic archives. Um, in Porto, that's the only happy visit that I've ever made to a prison, um, but I think things will be quite secure there. And then, of course, yesterday I had the great privilege of going to see uh, some of the uh, Frederick Flower negatives that you have here, the calotype negatives, which are kept safely in a seaside uh, fort. Uh, so I think your collections are, are very well defended. Perhaps not against bureaucracy, that's the thing that might sneak in the back door. He learned, he practiced stereo wet collodion photography on board the ship Titania on the way to Tenerife, and then went, by the time he got up the mountain there, uh, he was fairly adept at doing it. In here you see Jesse, uh, Piazzi Smith, Jesse Smith, who, uh, his wife, um, who was an essential scientific partner to him. And again, I'm sorry, we don't really have time to, to go into that relationship. But uh, as was so often the case, she was a very critical part of what he did. And I can't imagine hiking up Tenerife, um, hiking up the mountain in, dressed in black garb like this and the black hat and everything. Uh, the heat in that must have been absolutely stifling. Here you see him set up in his walls. One of the reasons that he liked stereo photography uh, or admired what it could do is the same thing that happened um, when NASA was first sending things out. I don't know if any of you remember the early transmissions back from the early uh, NASA missions to Mars and that but they'd be slowly painted out as the digits started flowing back. And one of the things you do in any sort of digital realm like that is that you have redundancy. You have essentially a check by running the same numbers again and again to make sure that there's no artifacts, that there's no accidents that happen in there. In stereo photographs, one of the things that Piazzi pointed out was that since you had two pictures of the same thing, if you had an accidental artifact, you know, a piece of iron or something in your developer uh, that created a rock that didn't really exist, you could detect that uh, from the other one. Uh, during World War II, stereo photographs were used for that same reason, uh, because you could see things, and for any bibliophiles in the audience, you may have used a Hinman collator, uh, which is based on a stereo instrument, which allowed you to compare two incunabula and if, say, a uh, letter was moved over slightly or something, it would pop up in three dimensions. So he used it not only to get the stereoscopic effect, but also as a check on what the photographic process was introducing. This was the observatory that they built at 11,000 feet. And in 1975, when the Isaac Newton telescope was being explored, the uh, astronomical team actually set up within Piazzi's old walls uh, up on the mountain of Tenerife. He was also interested in the flora and fauna and general scientific parts of Tenerife. This is the dragon tree, which was thought at the time to be the oldest living thing on Earth, um, 3,700 years old. I suppose that doesn't fit in with Trump's scheme. It'd have to be 37 years old, but. Um, 
3,700 years old, they thought it was, and it was one of the many things that he photographed. How many of you have an original copy of his book, Tenerife? Denny, I know you will have one. Um, it still comes up from time to time for those of you who haunt eBay. Uh, as the first publication that came out of this, he went to Lovell Reeve, who was a botanical publisher, and uh, in 1858 produced this volume that has original album and stereo prints in it. Um, if you can find one, uh, there were close to 2,000 copies printed in a couple of different printings, and it did get remaindered uh, back in about 1860. So you can still occasionally find copies, and to me it's one of the, the true touchstones in, in the history of photography. After that experience at Tenerife, uh, photography became very commonplace for him. So when it came to doing the official report, um, he naturally included photographs in the form of mounted albumin prints uh, in the official report. This is not a picture of the moon, but rather a stereo photograph of the model of the moon that James Naismith made in plaster based on photographs. So I'll let somebody tangle out the lineage there, but um, I think even more amazing, he went to the Royal Society and said that he wanted to do enlargements uh, to put some photographic plates in this report, and the committee came back and said that's impossible, enlarging is not possible, too much trouble, we can't do that. So Jessie went into her kitchen on the side of Colton Hill and stuck a board out the kitchen window and made an enlarged negative and started making enlarged prints. So if you ever are fortunate enough to find one of these reports, this is Jesse's enlarged from a stereo up to a full plate size. The word no uh, never settled well with Piazzi or Jesse. They then went on to Russia, uh, did a book in 1862 called Three Cities in Russia, which was a scientific tour, but also, uh, importantly, an observation of a culture that was little known in the West at the time. And most of these are in stereo. Um, again, he accompanied these with paintings. Uh, his, the reality in his mind was often conveyed better by one of his watercolors than it could be by photography. But this, Absolutely amazing picture uh, from 1860, 1858 actually. Uh, onlookers taken unconsciously in Novgorod. If that was in black and white, you would have no idea what time period that belonged to. It's a very, very modern sort of photojournalistic uh, picture. Quite extraordinary way of seeing the world. He and Jesse became interested in the questions around the Great Pyramid and uh, Piazzi, in beginning to study it, noticed that everybody's measurements were different. Uh, and he finally concluded that the only possible way to settle all this was actually to go to Egypt. Uh, this is a 1735 French engraving, uh, and you can tell that this artist had never been there. Uh, the Sphinx looks a bit like a Roman emperor. Uh, those of you who have been to Paris know the Pyramid, a uh, similar one in Rome, actually. Uh, very peaked compared to the Egyptian ones. And of course, this was the fantasy that that artist came up with. And this is the kind of visual thing that Piazzi was interested in taking on. He wanted, he was veering dangerously close to religion at this point because he said that there was no explanation for the precision of the pyramid, no man-made explanation. And he began being involved in the question of the lost tribes of Israel, and the Royal Society became a bit uncomfortable. So they refused to fund his trip to Egypt. So he funded it out of his own pocket and did what he called a poor man's photography uh, at the Great Pyramid. And I think you can see there very well from the title page uh, from the book that he published later on this. By this time, photography and stereo photography particularly was a, uh, just a common tool for him. These measuring sticks are from uh, warp measuring sticks from looms. He had a friend in the textile industry, so he took those out there and put them on things like the socket, the corner socket of the pyramid here, 
in order to be able to provide a scientific measure of, of what he was doing. And you can see his desk uh, set up there in the foreground. He was very inventive. Um, those of you, how many have worked in wet collodion? How many have worked with a view camera? How many have worked with both simultaneously? Yeah. Um, wet collodion negative is a common one of the period. You want the microphone? It's better not to hear, really. You can make up your own story with the pictures. Um, wet collodion uh, very quickly involved, uh, first of all, you had to make the negative on the spot and you had to develop it on the spot. And it'll be interesting to see the uh, wet collodion demonstration that's going to be here, uh, which meant that you had to take plates that were the size of the final print because you were going to contact print them you had to take collodion, which has alcohol and ether uh, in it. You had to take a tent, a uh, dark tent, in order to do all this. You had to coat the plate immediately beforehand, expose it, and then develop it immediately before it dried out. That's in the dust and sand and flies and heat of Egypt. What that meant was that if you're doing wet collodion conventional plates, you had to have a whole entourage of servants and porters to carry all this equipment. And Piazzi went as a poor man. He went just with Jesse. So he invented this little tin camera. He had had a problem at Tenerife because his wooden cameras had dried out at altitude and had cracked. So he made an all metal camera to take miniature negatives. Uh, you can see here that it has a cylindrical shutter, a very simple sandproof shutter. You just spin a cylinder and an aperture goes across and makes the exposure. And I think most brilliantly, uh, he developed, had a closed system for coating and developing uh, the collodion, uh, wet collodion negatives. He used microscope slides, which were readily available and very cheap, um, and put them in and did one inch square negatives, smaller than 35 millimeter, one inch square negatives. He could prepare them, immerse them in these baths and then take them out and pull the dark slide that you see and take pictures and then go back and process them later. So he made a self-contained system using miniature negatives because Jesse had already demonstrated that enlarging uh, was not really a problem. Uh, way, way ahead of his time. He also made only one camera but pointed out you could still do stereo as long as you had two different pictures. Uh, from two different points of view of the same object that you could combine those uh, into a stereo with whatever separation you decided you wanted. This is inside the Great Pyramid. And again, the measuring sticks that he has there. The light is provided by burning magnesium metal. Um, magnesium had only recently been made practical and he literally picked some up on the way to Egypt, picked them up in Salford outside Manchester. As he's traveling on the train through Egypt, he talks about burning strips of magnesium in the railway carriages just to see what it would do. Uh, you can imagine what the security forces would think of that now. But this is the great sarcophagus and the great pyramid. Um, and what you're seeing on the sides there are cascading burning magnesium falling down. Jesse in the background there, who moved during the exposure, and some of the local guides sitting in there. He could take only one or two exposures a day, because burning magnesium creates uh, a white powder, and the whole chamber would immediately fill up. So he bribed the tour guides to send the tourists off a different way, and he would do this first thing in the morning, and then they would clear out and wait till the next day. And that's a, an enlarged albumin print, again, from one of these. And that is literally fiery magnesium. You can imagine the magic of being inside the Great Pyramid and having magnesium dropping like that. I'm not expert at reading hieroglyphs, but uh, this is a charming little th thing that he stuck in one of his own personal books. I uh, found this in New York years ago. Uh, obviously, on the left, we have the pyramid. We have the symbol of pi.
Um, the uh, scientific attempt to go to it. In the center, we have the measuring instruments. Piazzi, of course, in a kilt, and um, uh, Jesse in a Scottish tartan, and Piazzi's beard jutting out there. Um, the key unlocking the knowledge, the lamp of truth, and so on. A very personal venture for them. As he went on in life and was not able to travel, he still maintained an interest in photography. Uh, these are clouds. Uh, you can see here on uh, the wet collodion negative, he scratched in the top varieties of clouds. Uh, again, taken with a miniature camera because we could do that uh, with higher speed. And at the end of his life in retirement, he and Jesse photographed this whole series of cloud forms that have been a very extended series uh, because they were no longer mobile, they let the world change outside them. They let nature change the clouds and uh, observed it from there. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Stieglitz's equivalence might draw an equivalency here. And appropriately enough, he and Jesse are buried under a pyramid uh, in Ripon in England. It was good to see the new museum uh, in Porto because the uh, walls are quite large. Uh, for those of you who have not been in that particular prison, uh, it's going to make an excellent display space for modern photography. Uh, some of you may know the work of Thomas Joshua Cooper, uh, who talks about uh, space and particular times and particular places. Uh, massive prints, which are now very popular uh, in museums. But I'm being a bit naughty here because this is not actually, uh, Thomas is a friend of mine and I hope he doesn't mind, not actually one of his pictures. This is by Henry Talbot in October of 1844, a mountain rivulet at the base of Dune Castle. If you had seen it this way, you would have thought it was a modern photograph and indeed it is a modern photograph. This is a whole new way of seeing things, a whole new way of imagining the world, a whole new vision uh, that we didn't have before. The concept of light sensitivity was something, of course, that was known for a long time. And uh, those of you who've gone to a beach perhaps uh, have either accidentally or intentionally created different forms on your body. Uh, of course, fruit ripens and you can do stencils. Uh, lots of ways of understanding that light can affect objects. I first saw the work of Joseph Ford Nieps at, um, at Texas, the supposedly worst, world's first photograph, which uh, I will not endorse, but I won't get into. Um, but this idea that photography, of course, existed before the great 1839 announcements. And again, going back to Edinburgh, if you're ever in the Cafe Royale, uh, make sure to get a pint in there. And below this old industrial tile from an exhibition, uh, you can see Neops looking on admiringly at what Daguerre did. My own version of this would have the two reversing roles, but that's another story. Daguerre had no need to invent photography. Fabulous painter, um, Hollywood Castle here, uh, very good at understanding and using light, and of course, um, the inventor of the diorama, which was a very early version of immersive media, Sorry we don't have anybody speaking on the diorama here this weekend. That would be another interesting topic. Henry Talbot, on the other hand, was a very private person, but a very brilliant young man. Uh, this was done by one of his cousins, one of his Walsh cousins, when Talbot was seven years old. He was born in 1800, so it makes it very easy to track him. Um, I always think of this solar flare of ideas coming out of his head here, you know, just bursting with, with imagination and creativity. But in fact, there's probably a more pedestrian explanation. This was probably done in a camera obscura, perhaps even just one that was hastily rigged up because that sort of thing would have been commonly used. Of course, the image would have been inverted by the lens and his young cousin got a little sloppy with the ink and gravity pulled it down. So probably this picture was originally made upside down. But he did have this relationship with science right from an early age. Um, 
At the National Museum in Edinburgh, they call this Talbot's Head. It's an electrostatic generator, of course, and when you crank that, then the woman's hair will start to go up, be attracted to the ball. This is the sort of thing that he grew up with. The camera obscura as a concept had been known for a very long time, uh, has nothing to do with the invention of photography. It was sitting there waiting to be applied to photography. So many people associate the camera with photography, but it was in no way essential. Instead, it was another instrument called the camera lucida. How many of you have suffered through trying to use a camera lucida? How many of you were successful? How many of you are good liars? <laughs> Talbot got married. He was a member of parliament. He got married in December of 1833. His wife had never been to the continent. He did have parliamentary duties to do. But finally, in the summer of 18, uh, I'm sorry, in the summer of 1833, he got married in 32. In the summer of 1833, uh, they went off uh, on a con her first continental tour. This was something that Talbot had done very often. And of course he took her to Italy, as one must, and they wound up eventually uh, at the town of Bellagio uh, on Lake Como at the beginning of October 1833. And other family members came, and Talbot is a very accomplished scientist by this point. He's published quite a few scientific papers and books. Um, he's a member of parliament. He's a master of everything except the pen and the pencil. He cannot draw. And here is his new wife and his sister and his brother-in-law and several other people all sketching away uh, very happily, making a record of what's there. And here's Talbot trying to make a sketch and he can't do it. So he turns to the camera lucida and feels that perhaps um, the scientific instrument can help him translate nature onto the paper. Uh, this is my wife's camera lucida set up there uh, at the Villa Melzi right outside Bellagio um, before George Clooney was there. She can draw, I cannot. I'm the Henry Talbot of our family. Uh, I've studied Talbot a long time. Uh, I can promise you that what you're about to see is the very, very finest drawing that Talbot ever accomplished. You can see why he needed to invent photography. Even with the camera lucida, he still didn't know how to translate that very colorful three-dimensional uh, forms and shapes and lines into monochromatic lines on paper. He had no idea how to reduce that world. But this is what got him to thinking about getting nature to do the drawing for him. And he knew that many materials were light sensitive. Uh, he returned to parliamentary duties at the end of December. Sometime in the spring of 1834, when those began to ease up at Laycock Abbey, he began to put this Italian dream into effect. He started out by working on paper because of course he wanted to make a sketch on paper. So it was logical for him to start with that. Uh, he knew the salts of silver were particularly sensitive to light. And so very quickly, he determined that by coating uh, silver compounds on paper, putting it under objects out in the light, that he could make what we call a photogram. He didn't know about Thomas Wedgwood and others at this time that had done this before, but he ran into the same problem that they did. There wasn't a way to remove those light sensitive chemicals. So as you started viewing that picture, it kept darkening and you literally destroyed it by viewing it. A modern performance artist might appreciate that, certainly Talbot did not. He wanted to see his sketch. Uh, but it was through a two-stage process, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss this in more technical detail later, but he discovered that he could use common table salt and other compounds to fix that picture, to make it relatively permanent. And by the summer of 1835, he's increased the sensitivity of things enough so that he can start doing negatives in a camera. This is a lovely little original at George Eastman House. It's maybe about this big. Uh, 
You can see it's very exuberantly coated, very informally. Uh, the corners are torn because it was pasted in the back of a makeshift wooden camera uh, for exposure, and the exposure time is probably half an hour. It's a silhouette of the tower of his house of Laycock Abbey. You could see Harry Potter flying over, perhaps. The, it's a negative, as we would view it now. Talbot didn't think of it that way. He called them skiography, literally shadow drawings. You know, the same way that you do this sort of thing. Theatrical is the way he thought of it. And uh, to him, this is what nature did, because he knew the light darkened the silver, so the fact that it came out negative to him was entirely natural. He didn't even think of what that might mean later. Skipping to 1839, Daguerre makes his surprise announcement in Paris. Um, huge uh, promotional machinery behind that. Huge rivalry between France and Britain at the time. Talbot has no idea what Daguerre has done except that he knows that he's produced images in the camera obscura. And so Talbot very hastily went to show his own work, which he knew he had invented independently. He didn't even know at this point that it differed from what Daguerre did. Now there's a huge difference in the way that photography took off. This is the Chamber of Deputies in Paris. I was just in there a couple weeks ago. It looks now hauntingly like the engravings when Daguerre made his announcement, or rather more properly, Arago made it for him. Uh, this is a very formal scientific institution. Um, the fellows are very, very formal there, uh, the members of the academy. Uh, this was presented, Daguerre's invention was presented in this sort of environment. Talbot went to his friend Michael Faraday, who lectured at the Royal Institution. And on the 25th of January, 1839, Talbot brought in some of his early photographs that had been done in 1834 and 1835, brought them into the Royal Institution, and at the end of Faraday's very popular Friday lecture, he directed people to the library where there was this exhibition of these photographs, the world's first photographic exhibition. And basically, Faraday said, now that Dame Nature has become our drawing mistress, we have no idea where this is going to go in the future. Look at the audience here. Men and women were both welcome at the Royal Institution. The lectures were public. Uh, you had to be of a certain status, because you had to have free time to come to a lecture. Of course, it had to be during daylight, because it wasn't practical to illuminate the hall. So a regular workman couldn't get off from work. But as long as you had the leisure time, you could come to this. And we know at least 300 people came to that lecture and exhibition, uh, possibly more. But a totally different situation than the presentation of the daguerreotype in this very, very formal way. What Talbot could show in January, I believe this is one of the actual pictures it's a copy of a piece of lace. It is a negative uh, in proper terms. Uh, please don't ask me why he trimmed it to this very wild shape, because I'll have to fabricate an answer, uh, something I don't understand myself. But you can imagine when people first saw this, when they didn't know anything about it, this was the immersive media of that day. Uh, uh, his friend Hooker, uh, Tom, uh, John uh, Thomas Hooker said, uh, a botanist, um, when he first received one of these, he said he first passed it to his wife because he thought that Talbot meant to send a sample of lace. He didn't even realize that it was a photographic copy. It was so perfect. And these wonderful overlapping leaves where you're beginning to get a three-dimensionality, a sense of three-dimensionality created. All of these were done by contact and most commonly done uh, out in sunlight, not using a camera at first. The daguerreotype and eventually the calotype, which was not his first process, but the one that we know the most, um, were fundamentally different. Even though we now both call them photography, they were distinguished very much in its day. On the left, one of John Ruskin's daguerreotypes of Venice 
uh, incredibly highly detailed. Uh, you can swim in daguerreotypes. I imagine uh, most of you have seen an original daguerreotype. Maybe some of you own one. Um, frankly, it's best seen, sorry, uh, best seen if you are in a dark room with a candle and a glass of vino tinto. Uh, perhaps two glasses if you have a good friend there. But it's a very intimate experience, and that's the very best way to see one of these. The negative that Talbot created, on the other hand, on paper, was a very different beast. You couldn't immediately understand what you saw because it was reversed. But it did have the ability to make multiple prints from that, which we'll get into in a moment. So they're going to take very different directions. As much as I love the daguerreotype, and I was afraid of getting stoned when I said this, I just gave two talks at the Daguerrean Society in New York. Um, but the daguerreotype has some built-in limitations. It is on silver-plated sheet of copper, uh, very expensive to begin with. It is a unique image produced in the camera. And of course, it's very difficult to scale up. This is the largest daguerreotype I've ever seen. A uh, rather grumpy uh, minister at the uh, Science Museum uh, holding this up for me to take the picture. It weighs an awful lot. Um, but the daguerreotype was a very lovely dead end. Absolutely necessary, I think, to fire the imagination of the public about photography at the beginning, but eventually, uh, it was not going to have a role. It wasn't actually until April of 1839 that Talbot's mother got after him, Lady Elizabeth Fielding. She was the prime moving force behind him and said, look, people don't understand what negatives are. You have to make prints. But also he had been giving away all of his negatives and was running out of materials. So this in April is the very first uh, photograph camera photograph I know that he made a print from. He had understood a de decade before about what a negative could do to make a print. He just never saw any need to. Uh, this is one in St. Petersburg in Russia that's uh, been marvelously preserved. Throughout 1839, Sir John Herschel, uh, this is my favorite Julia Margaret Cameron portrait of him, not the typical one. Uh, Sir John Herschel was just about Talbot's only friend in photography. The Royal Society was in a complete mess. Uh, unlike the French Academy that had supported Daguerre so well, uh, basically Talbot had no uh, support at all in England during the year of 1839. And by November of that year, uh, I can imagine he was much more comfortable with this photograph. This is taken in his uh, library. Uh, those are the objects that are familiar with him, a few objects of art. Uh, particularly books, uh, you can see how soft this looks. And the reason for that is that this would have been a very long exposure and the light would have moved during that time. The shadows would have changed and so it softened the whole thing. But I can imagine this was Talbot's dream uh, by the end of 1839. He's quite happy to be shut up in Lake Hawk Abbey and away from the world. But in the spring of 1840, the light came on very early, his spirits came back, and he began producing photographs that are quite incredible. I did not Photoshop this, this is a faded print, and I left it just the way it is. I think it has its own sort of beauty. Um, I was surprised in Porto to see how many old buildings have been fixed up. I'm a hopeless romantic, I like some of the old ones with their patina and I prefer this this way. This was done from a negative that was done by printing out. And again, we can get into the technical aspects later if you wish, but the negative had no development. It was produced entirely by solar energy. When you took it out of the camera, the image was already there. I used to say like Polaroid, I suppose I should say like digital now, um, but you saw the image right away. So Talbot had a chance to set his camera up and then see what nature had drawn for him within a matter of a minute or so. And this is one of his sister's windows and look at the pearls and the way that light is modulated there and think back to that pencil drawing that he had done six years before and think how far nature has taken him already. A negative now in the Getty, 
a photogenic drawing negative, not a calotype negative, on paper, about this big, and you can see where he's beginning to observe artistic things. He was never an artist before. You can see the glint there on the shovel, uh, the arrangement with the stone. In a basket at the base of a larch tree. Accidentally, as he continued through 1840, he discovered the latent image in September of 1840. He discovered that a short exposure in the camera um, produced an image that was not visible, but by chemically developing it, you could amplify that effect thousands of times. The chemical equivalent of using a microphone, but by using a very short exposure, then you could develop it and have a strong final image. This immediately cut his exposure times from say tens of minutes down to just a few seconds, uh, virtually instantaneous. He was so unhappy about the reception in 1839 that he was determined this time to uh, protect his reputation more. He actually cut the ingredient out of his notebook so that nobody could accidentally discover what he did. And that was gallic acid, uh, which was the developer. This is a terracotta statue in the front hall of Laycock Abbey. Um, this is in November of 1840. This is just about seven years after that terrible pencil sketch at Bellagio. And look what he has here. He has Diogenes, uh, the seeker of truth. The pattern of light, of course, comes from the windows uh, at the front of Laycock Abbey, the stained glass windows. Um, I used to stay at Laycock quite a bit when the family was there. And after visitors would clear out, uh, they closed the doors. And this big wooden cupboard in the front room right next to Diogenes would open up. And out would come the gin and whiskey. And I spent many an afternoon there uh, watching the sunset. And this pattern of light races across the room. And this image exists for maybe a minute at most in this composition. And Talbot is able to capture that in a matter of a couple of seconds. And if photography had stopped with this photograph, um, I wouldn't be entirely unhappy because it is, I think, as sophisticated as photography can get. And this is just a few years after he couldn't even make a rudimentary pencil sketch. From there, the magic continued. Uh, snapshots of our friends, our loved ones, are so commonplace today, we don't even think about them. In Talbot's day, if you came from a good family, you might get a portrait of your children once, maybe twice in their lifetime. And here he is in November of 1840, taking a snapshot of his wife and daughters. An elaborately arranged table, all these forms and textures. His very patient friend, Patroclus, uh, plaster bust. Notice here, of course, all of these are still coated by hand, all these sheets of paper. This is actually, if I ask you to describe the space, you would probably talk in terms of spaciousness, comfort, serenity, terms like that. This is actually a very small little bit of water. Uh, he put his camera right down on the embankment. This is the uh, stew pond where the nuns used to grow fish for the kitchen at Laycock. Very tiny area. And he was impressed uh, with what artists had said about shadow and light and said that often artists appreciated something that was vis visited in partial gloom. Here we have the spires of Oxford as the sun sets, beginning to change this doorway. June of 1841, I don't know if you can see his inscription in the negative there at the bottom. The uh, Thames in London, uh, for those of you who know London, this is taken from the location of the Shell Mex building. Um, this is a medieval photograph. This is right after the Houses of Parliament had burnt, before the new ones went up, before Big Ben went up. And so you're seeing Westminster Abbey 
in the same way that somebody in the 15th century would have seen it, uh, in a way that none of us have seen it since. Nelson's Monument in Trafalgar Square, um, the first great public space built in Britain, and really indeed one of the first in Europe. Uh, of course, the 1840s was a time of great political unrest. And what's particularly fascinating about photography is that even though it says post no bills, of course people did put them up, and by comparing the uh, playbills and the railway timetables and that, we can actually date this photograph within about a week. Ruan. Nicholas Henneman on the right, uh, seen in a negative here at Laycock Abbey, uh, shaking hands with John Frederick Goddard, who was a daguerreotypist who uh, took an interest in Talbot's work. Uh, Nicholas Henneman was Talbot's servant before, but then broke off that service and went to start his own independent printing establishment uh, in the town of Reading. And this is uh, tableau vivant, if you will. Uh, this is a, an, an artificial reconstruction uh, in his mind of, of what Henneman imagined should happen there. You can see the copying of artwork, uh, someone in the dark house preparing plates. Reportedly Talbot in the center, uh, and there's now a bronze statue made after this. I don't think it is actually Talbot but we'll skip over that little nicety. Uh, the printing racks, all of these negatives had to be printed one-to-one -one in the sun. Uh, Nicholas Henneman on the right photographing statuary and then a technical focusing experiment on the far right. This was all towards the publication of photographs and the first great publication was The Pencil of Nature, which Talbot started issuing in 1844 with original photographic prints. And the very first, and I think very immersive picture that's in there, is this part of Queen's College in Oxford, which is an extraordinary way to see this area. Um, if you can imagine prints and lithographs of the period, you would never see buildings truncated like this. You would never see this sort of framing. You'd never see the emphasis on the texture of the stone that's there. It's a very photographic photograph, if you will. And particularly, the main subject there is light, or indeed the absence of it, the shadows that really form the main part of the composition. Things like the haystack, where he talked about the great detail. This is the actual calotype negative um, that you see every little blade of straw in there. But nobody understood photography yet. So starting with the second part, he had to introduce the idea that these plates were indeed original sun prints. They were not engravings and imitation. Um, he then went on to Scotland uh, to photograph sun pictures in Scotland in October of 1844, the mountain rivulet that we saw at the beginning. Uh, here, Sir Walter Scott's monument, taken at the end of an autumnal day, as Talbot put it. He intentionally waited for suppressed lighting to add the mood to this picture. Or Lac Catrin, seen in Lady of the Lake. And think how modern this composition is. This is 1844, and this is that guy who couldn't do a pencil sketch. Extraordinary composition. Probably Talbot's best known picture is the open door. If you know one Talbot picture from art history, it's probably this one. Uh, and unusually, I'll go through this very quickly, but unusually it's one of the only uh, pieces of art where we have some idea about how the thinking process went. Uh, in 1841, this is the earliest iteration of this that I've traced, and uh, he begins to get an idea. Uh, he knows that there's something there, but he has a rather pathetic little broom and uh, hasn't really figured out the composition. 1843. Same thing, he's not really quite got it yet. Another one from about that time, he's still not quite figured out what he's trying to see, but there's something that intrigues him about this scene. Unfortunately, he didn't write about it, but you can tell visually he keeps returning to it. And then his negatives start getting a little better, his thinking starts getting a little better. 
One of the reasons I'm intrigued with this catalog raisonne I'm working on is that it's beginning to associate material that we never did before. This is one of a number of very similar negatives uh, of the north rank of Lake Hawk Abbey where the brewery was. Um, you can see it's in winter, you can see it's bare trees. I didn't really pay much attention to this negative until in a computer database I suddenly lined up some dates. Look right there. Sorry, I don't have a laser. Look right there, and I will use Photoshop at this point. You can see his camera set up in front of it with a dark cloth draped over it and the broom in the doorway. We actually have a record of the making of a piece of art, highly unusual. And that's a picture that resulted from it at that point. Um, this, oh, thank you. Okay. These modernists. I use an oil lamp usually, but. Um, you probably wouldn't have seen this in art history books. You know, it probably would never have made the cut. But of course, the final image, the open door, uh, in a splendid hand-coated print that's untrimmed, and the shadow and the lines, the sense of space from the window through there, and everything is just uh, finally absolutely perfect. And that is the original negative that still survives. Uh, if the conservators would let us, we could still print it. After that, Talbot uh, and Henneman and others began to try to promote photography as a publication medium, but unfortunately found that it had a fatal flaw. These were two open doors that probably started out about the same condition. The one on the top you can't see, but it has a fancy gilt border on it. It was probably exhibited. Too much UV hit it, and it faded the picture. The one on the bottom was probably a defective print originally, kept in a portfolio, kept in a drawer, and therefore has survived better. But once things got out in the real world, beyond Talbot's control, they went to London, people had coal smoke in their fires, sulfur in the air, humidity, people put them up in their windows. Uh, he briefly made transparencies to put in windows, but of course they only lasted a few weeks. Uh, so all of these factors that he couldn't control. So when Talbot was working at Laycock Abbey as a solitary inventor in peace, he could control conditions. I think you can hopefully see his printing frames set out there, three of them right outside Laycock Abbey. But the reality is when Henneman tried to scale up this production at Reading, um, the reality was he probably only had a boy as an assistant. Uh, the water was not very good. He had to make prints on a production schedule, whether it was good sunshine or rain, and therefore uh, trying to scale this up to a commercial level uh, made the whole process fail. How many of you made your own pasta? Oh dear, we need to have some culinary work done here. That'll be the next seminar. Um, pasta is deceptively, deceptively simple, and you can buy a pasta making machine, and you can measure ingredients and dump them in, and you'll get a noodle, and your guests will be happy enough. But it really consists of eggs and flour, and usually not salt, although some people put it in, and sometimes water. But it seems very, very simple. But like early photography, what's really critical is how all of these things work together in subtle ways. When your recipe says put in an egg, well, what size egg is that? You know, and how much moisture does it have? What did that chicken eat? What contaminants are in there? Five eggs, you say. Um, what contaminants are in there? Uh, all of these different things that happen. So it's much better for you to take a Mount Vesuvius of flour and put in the eggs and let your fingers feel what's happening. And a lot of early photographic production is that same way. Uh, the reason that a lot of these people were really brilliant is that their fingers and their heart told them what to do, more than formulas, uh, more than measuring. And of course you need specialized instruments as well. <laughs> 
Uh, I've mentioned Lady Fielding, his mother, uh, who was an enormous influence on his life, uh, propelled him forward in photography. Uh, this is a portrait he made of her in 1842. Outside Laycock Abbey, you can see the flowers on the lawn. And I can't help but think that he was thinking of the Canova uh, that he had seen at one time. And it's through her diaries that we get a lot of the record of Talbot's accomplishments. Uh, she uh, very much directed photography, very much like a film director would do. This is Matilda Talbot, his granddaughter. Uh, I'll have to speed up here a little bit, but this is his granddaughter who began to preserve his legacy after she inherited Laycock Abbey uh, right around the time of World War I. Marvelous lady. Um, she was uh, in the military service briefly, but they said she had too big a mouth. Uh, so um, commanders didn't really like her. I hope there's no conservators in the audience. Uh, you, you're allowed to be ill at this point. This is an exhibition held in 1934 at Laycock Abbey. Uh, no, I did not see it. Uh, but these things were so unknown and unvalued at the time that the entire interior of Laycock Abbey was carpeted with all these original Talbot photographs. That billboard now with those Talbots in that condition would be worth millions, um, but at the time it had no commercial value. We'll return to that shortly. Um, also for conservators, this is Harold White who went there in the 1950s and began trying to sort the correspondence. And you can see his cigarette dangling there uh, to prove that he's serious about his research. It wasn't until I had started with mainframe computers and punch cards back in my electrical engineering days, back in the 1960s, but it wasn't until 1982 that I finally got my first personal computer, an IBM PC. It had a whopping 64K of RAM, 64K, but it was a marvelous way to begin to assimilate all these things that had stymied previous researchers. And then I got my first laptop. It was very exciting. It had a four-line screen. Uh, it recorded on micro cassettes, but I was able to go out in the field and begin it gathering information. So this is how I started down the current path. There are more than 10,000 of Talbot's letters surviving to and from. And uh, this, you know, nobody had been able to assimilate this before computers. Got all of these into a database and eventually, as was mentioned, we published these at, initially at the University of Glasgow and now at De Montfort. So you can go online and read uh, transcriptions of 10,000 letters. Uh, and most of them are not about photography. Most of them are about the real world. So um, it's uh, something that's applicable to lots and lots of people. They still occasionally turn up. You know, you'd sometimes on eBay you can get lucky. Uh, that I think I found most of the 10,500 or so, but uh, once in a while something new pops up. This is Anthony Burnett Brown, Talbot's grandson at Laycock Abbey, sadly now deceased, uh, who was enormously patient at running around Laycock trying to figure out uh, where all these photographs came from. And some of the things still exist. If I don't burn a hole in the screen here, I think you can readily identify from Talbot's 1843 picture uh, the article of glass that's now preserved uh, in the collection at Oxford. For years, uh, this Neapolitan carriage uh, was a painting that Talbot had copied, and I kept asking Anthony about it, and one day he finally found it in the brewery, sort of half buried, had a hole in it, since been restored. Uh, but some of these things still exist that uh, provide us a touchstone with the original photographs. I showed this hand many times. I had many people come up with Masonic interpretations, religious interpretations uh, of what was there. But uh, finally, we discovered the, uh, this plaster hand of one of his uh, sisters. And I think probably that this is what the original of that was. Uh, I've run out of time here, so I'm going to go very quickly through different examples. The, uh, because a lot of the negatives are faded, we're able to take the outline of these hand-cut negatives. There would be very slight variances, and so there might be a negative in the Smithsonian, which you can see here is dated, but totally blank sheet of paper, but a print in South Africa 
that the outline matches. And by bringing these two objects together in a virtual museum, uh, we're able to date the picture in South Africa and of course identify the subject of the blank piece of paper at the Smithsonian. Being on paper, some of these were cut down successfully. Those of you who are fans of CSI, we have lots of uh, fingerprints that you can analyze. And even pictures we thought we knew so well. One day I was looking at a pile of open doors and the shadow moved. Of course, he had two negatives. I started trying to copy these as much as I could. This is in Russia in 1994. Uh, I had built a portable light stand that fit in a briefcase. I'm surprised I wasn't shot for being a spy. Um, but sometimes it was possible to form a photograph. More often I had to work from things like this or illustrations in books or drugstore snapshots. Uh, long before digital photography uh, made any of this possible. But all of this went into a database uh, very similar to the letters. If I had tried to publish 25,000 photographs on the web back in, say, the year 2000, I would have been Kim Kardashian. I would have broken the web. You know, there was no way to do that then. But now the technology has advanced to the point. Um, at Oxford, at the home of Alice in Wonderland, uh, we're finally putting together this catalog raisonné that'll be available online. These are the early wireframes. You'll be able to search pictures, build up your own uh, little libraries of them, and also contribute information automatically. And this will be a crowdsourced. The last photograph I know that Talbot took was in September of 1845. His good friend Calvert Jones, this lovely print at Laycock Abbey. Between his mother dying, his own personal health, the silver prints fading, all of these things mitigated against his original dream of photography. And by the time he exhibited in 1852, the first great photographic exhibition in London, he talked about photography as being of an earlier period. None of these are of a later date. This was all ancient history to him. And instead he turned to photogravure and spent the last 30 years of his life perfecting bringing photography to the printed page through ink which of course proved to be the final path. Now being a stereo conference, I did have to toss in a couple of stereos. Um, I have, we know that Talbot did some work in stereo um, uh, for Charles Wheatstone. Um, so far, I don't think, Denis, we found any of these. I was hoping you wouldn't correct me, but it'd be exciting if you could. Um, but we do have a couple little hints, and hopefully more of this will emerge with the catalog raisonné. Boulevard of Paris in an album, um, a picture that is relatively common. We come in, and if you look right down in the corner, I don't know if we have the resolution to see it, but there's LH. LH does not correspond to the initials of anybody I know that worked with Talbot. It's almost got to be left hand. And that would be, I think, an appropriate picture for a stereo. So, there's maybe stereo number one. Maybe stereo number two comes from his friend Calvert Jones. This is Calvert's wife, Anne Harriet Jones. Uh, again, a fascinating woman in the early history of photography. The negative for this survives. And if you see in the upper left corner there, it says right side. Close enough? And again, that would make, I think, a really good stereo image. So if you can find the other halves for me, we'll be all set. We'll both be happy. Um, I'm sorry I've run slightly over time here, but uh, I just want to finish with one thing. At the time, critics talked about Talbot's photography as being able to retrieve the sunshine of yesterday. And that it did. We can see the Oriel window at Laycock, this marvelous negative uh, just like we're first waking up in the morning and beginning to see the window, we can see this light from 1835 and yet see it still today. It's been preserved. That time has been frozen. Uh, in 1951, and I promise never to uh, rat them out, but a lovely elderly couple I met in London had illegally made a wire recording off the air. And uh, this is back when the BBC uh, made very few recordings of interviews because 
uh, it was so expensive. They were made on 16 inch platters. And uh, so basically they didn't make recordings of much. And it was illegal to record anything off the air from BBC. So this couple was still terrified when I met them many years later that BBC was gonna come pounding on their door. They had made an illegal wire recording of Matilda Talbot, the granddaughter, talking. It's a very short uh, little piece here, but this, in the same way as preserving the sunshine of yesterday, this is a voice of someone who had sat on Henry Talbot's knee. Now, in this recording, which at the time it was made could well have been called a living link with the inventor of photography, we hear the voice of the granddaughter of the great polymath. Uh, Miss Talbot, why are you celebrating the 150th anniversary? Well, because I suppose we all celebrated the 100th. And that was missed. It seemed very difficult to do it then. And so we're doing it now, with all the kind cooperation we're having. It's most encouraging. You had some kind of exhibition about 15 years ago, didn't you? Yes. In uh, 1934, when my brother was alive, who was an FSA, and also when Mr. Uh, Herbert Lambert, the rather distinguished photographer of Bath, was then alive, we celebrated... Uh, what we considered was a feature of that year, namely the hundredth year since my grandfather had got a practical result. We had no photographs that we knew had been actually taken in 1834, but we knew he had attained the practical result from which everything else developed in that year. And one of the first photographs was taken in this window, wasn't it? Yes, a photograph that fortunately he himself dated, 1835, in his own writing, about which there's no mistake, was taken of the window in this gallery, which is still here, of course. And uh, he noted at the end of the card on which this tiny little negative was uh, fastened that it was possible, uh, with the aid of a glass, to count the number of panes in the latticed window. And that is so, because we proved that we could count them, although so early, the negative was sharp enough for that. That's wonderful. Do you remember your grandfather at all yourself? Just a little. Uh, I came to this house when I was six years old in the summer with my family from Scotland. And he died in September of the same year. But we distinctly remember him. He was very gentle and kind and not at all alarming. And he let us look through his microscope, which has left an indelible memory with me. Did he ever take a photograph of you oh, no. as a child? No, I'm sure he didn't. I expect there wasn't a promising subject. And I think that's about as immersive as I can get. Thank you.